Hi, I don't have a very good message for you today, and uh, I know it's just right in the beginning of the day. Uh, why we are sitting here in our comfortable chairs and talking about the future, humankind is on the way to extinction. And that's just simply because Earth is right now deciding to get rid of us, humans. And you might say, human extinction, how come? Uh, the dinosaurs have been extinct, but us humans with our big brains and technology, we can master every challenge. Sorry, people, we need to talk about this. And um, in 18 minutes of time, you will become pioneers of how to master um, climate change yourself. And in order to start with this, we have to speak about humanity, and we have to speak about the two sides of humanity, how humanity in history can develop. It can develop to one side, and this is the side of prosperity and uh, solidarity and uh, peacefulness, but it can also develop to the other side through history towards a more darker side, like um, death and, 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 and war and destruction. So by talking about this, I need to speak about my wonderful grandmother from Poland. Um, and when, when I was a boy, I was sitting one evening at her bed, and she started to tell me stories about her childhood. That's grandmother as a child. And as a child, she had to do forced labor for a German family to avoid the camp. And the memories she, she was telling me portrayed the world where there was on one side, there was a group of people having a lot of power over another group of people, a weak group. And the first group, the powerful one, they were using this power and executing it to the maximum extent, to get the most they could. And for me, this was, of course, very puzzling, because you cannot compare uh, this thing with climate change, but it was puzzling me how such a culture of me before you could sustain in a society. And I think it's, it's because of the norms of a society we create in order to justify what we do. It's the norms that justify our daily actions. So here we have wonderful Kamea. Kamea is a girl, uh, and she is, she is the citizen of Kiribati. Kiribati is this wonderful country consisting of 33 atolls and islands in the Pacific Ocean. Unfortunately, this uh, home of Kamea is going to sink in almost two decades. And if it doesn't sink, or it will sink, obviously, uh, Kamea might not survive also because of the typhoons coming in and, and the waves hitting against the, the little huts and boats and houses on this island because of coconut trees, not having coconuts anymore, or the fish that is just missing because the coral reefs are being destroyed. So there is a big, big challenge to us um, with climate change, and maybe it is the biggest challenge humanity has ever faced. I mean, look at this. I think this is a German, German city. It looks German. So, um, <laughs> it's, 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 really, it's, really, it's really a big thing. And we need to master this together and find a solution. And this is why I started to research into a film, um, a documentary film on the climate change negotiations. So what does it mean? All countries in the world are coming together to one place since 21 years, and they are trying to find a common ground on how to act against climate change together. That's very, very difficult if you have like 195 decision makers. Um, but they are trying. And what they need to do is to keep global warming below 2 degrees Celsius. This is a red line. If we cross that line, we will trigger dangerous climate change. And it's going to look like this. Just imagine like the polar ice sheets are melting away and they are disintegrating, they are floating. Or the biggest rivers in the world, the Amazonian River and the Mississippi River, dry out. I think they even dried out once in summer two years ago already. Um, Deserts spread over Africa and make life totally impossible. Same time, we have a race of, race of sea levels almost to seven or eight meters. Uh, knowing exactly that 80% of all cities in the world are um, in coastal areas. And in the end, you know, um, there is 
lots of methane also in the sea ground and in permafrost, maybe you read about it, permafrost is, is melting, and all this methane gets out, it's causing additional heating of the atmosphere, and, and it simply means, you know, most of the species die out. I see you're already depressed. <laughs> so, um, you might want to know now, like, okay, two degrees is the limit, how much did we get? We got 0 0.9 degrees already. We are half the way through. Uh, and you see in the media what's, what's happening. What's the trend? Where are we going? No, sitting here doing nothing. Uh, we are going towards 4 to 6 degrees. 4 to 6. So you might say, wow, that's nice. You know, I don't like the winter. I like summer. I like when it's warm. Uh, sorry, but we are talking about average 2 degrees. So if we manage to keep it below 2, then for a country, mountain skiing country like Austria, we will get 6 to 8 degrees more because it's just average, it depends on the country. And for, I don't know, a sub-Saharan country, it might be uh, 6 to 8 degrees more, plus a little bit more, so they end up with 55 degrees, maybe. So that's really a bad thing. And humankind is the only species with the ability to abstract thinking, so we can go in the future, go in the past, find, try to find solutions. And we need also to, to speak about the moral dimension of this situation. Like, what is the moral dimension? In the end, it's very simple. So, we have one group of people uh, that emitted the most of carbon dioxide, and it just went in the atmosphere, it's still there. And we have another group of people, uh, mostly the most vulnerable ones and the weakest ones, the poorest countries in the world in the South, that will be harmed and they will have to, price, to pay the price for this. And that's tragic because these countries have already paid the price during colonialism for our prosperity. So, what does it mean, for example, for... This is like the capital of the Maldives, and they will go. Like, these islands, about 40 islands are endangered, 40 countries, and um, we cannot save them anymore, it's too late. Because negotiating went on for so long and so long, and we have taken so much time, that uh, we cannot do anything about losing these countries. So for the first time in history, we have to agree and accept that because we are not able to reduce you know, economical benefits and we are not able to change economy uh, to a more green economy, uh, we are agreeing to a race to wipe out whole countries, I mean, this, the most beautiful countries in the world, we are agreeing to wipe them out. Uh, because we are not able to do that. So I, I think it will forever to ch change the perception of you know, the people in the South about the white men from the North. Uh, so we have to think about that going on holidays to the Seychelles. But let's go deeper and let's try to find out what we can do and what's behind that. Let's take a look at corporations. Corporations uh, play a specific role in that. And we have to talk about the recent report by the Union of Concerned Scientists. The Union of Concerned Scientists released a report saying that um, corporations, fossil fuel corporations like ExxonMobil, for example, have known about all this, uh, what the product is causing. They knew already, they had the science that it will destroy the ecosystem already as early in the 1970s but they have done the most in order to protect the business. Uh, so Big Oil has been sponsoring climate skeptics and it has been sponsoring uh, scientists and, and, and campaigners in order to make us believe and make the politicians believe climate change is not happening. And if it happens, um, it happens not because of us humans. So, uh, to some extent, this was very much comparable to what the tobacco industry did for, for many, many years. Uh, they had the exact science in their hands, but they were telling us, you know, uh, smoking doesn't kill. Uh, so this plays a specific role, and we again need to think about what are the norms and what, what, was the, what, what the, is the set of norms we accept and we carry every day, because it's not just them, it's us, it's you and me every day, we carry this on. So, um, go with me and let's, let's dig into the prisoner's dilemma. Let's go back to Cold War. And during Cold War, there was one theory 
uh, called game theory. And it was a theory meant to model and explain human behavior in a mathematic sense. Um, the most uh, prominent experiment was the prisoner's dilemma. The prisoner's dilemma was meant to analyze if you have two people and they meet and they have to cooperate with each other in order to achieve uh, uh, you know, a common good. The best outcome rationally seen is not to cooperate, just to take what you have and run. Don't cooperate, don't trust. Uh, this is the way to get the most for, for short-term benefits. And unfortunately, it's very much comparable with the climate dilemma, where you have you know, people coming together, trying to, to cooperate, but there is no trust and there is no there's this short-term thinking. Unfortunately, all of these experiments, uh, game theoretical experiments, were very simple experiments, and they were very easy to communicate, and they made it up to the core of economy, to the core of, for example, neoliberal agenda, neoliberal economy, where you have a free market, and on this free market you have the maximum freedom for the agents that are uh, with maximum competition towards each other. So they are competing with each other, and this should bring the maximum um, outcome, the best outcome for the society. And these models, these mathematical models, were so simple, they were easily to fed into a computer, because from human mentality and human mind, that is obviously very complex, you made numbers and you made models and you made you know, uh, very simple things to, to be able to model them, uh, and still there is hope. Because <laughs> since the last 15 or 20 years, scientists see humans are not that rational. We do many things that are not rational. We, we, uh, we act because of emotions and memories and expectations and social obligation. So just imagine you are sitting in a cafe and there is a, you know, a grandmother walking by and she's having her groceries with her and suddenly she falls. What would you do? You have this grandmother lying on the ground. You help her up and you walk her home and you know, you go over with the groceries, maybe drink a cup of tea with her. And how does this make you feel? What's the feeling of helping grandma? It's joy. It's just joy. So we have, we have these cooperative reflexes in us to help strangers. We don't even know, and we might never see again, children in the age of two and one year already have coded instincts to help others, even though they have never seen uh, something like this before. So even you know, our body, our cells, Trillions of cells cooperating in this body together, you know, to make your eyes and make you human. Uh, if they would be selfish cells, you know, they would be never, ever multicellular organisms in evolution. We would simply not be there. So if you have, for example, cancer, you have these selfish uh, cells that are reproducing themselves, and what are they causing? They are causing the death of the body. So. How could we end up in this world, like um, a world where you have a group of people and, and, and agents and corporations that like ruthlessly uh, exploit nature and, and they, they harm our future and they are harming the future of Kamea, uh, and same time making lots of money with that, you know? So I think we need to change that, and I hope you agree on <laughs> we need to change the system. I don't knew, know how much time I have, because it says one minute, but I, I hope the timer is wrong. And <laughs> I try to be fast. How to save the world in 55 seconds. But I, I think it's, it's wrong. <laughs> Give me more time. We need more time. Ten minutes, seven, five, three, three minutes. Okay, good. We can manage that. So, okay, uh, it's about launching a normative change. Normative change. We need to change the norms of society. We need to shift from national interests uh, and this short-time junky consumerist behavior towards something like a global uh, responsible citizenship. And how to do that? We need pioneers. We need you. Because never underestimate the power of a small group of people that is really uh, convinced to do something 
and to, to, to change something. And we also have a new currency to do that. It's not the money, it's not the dollar or euro. We have something very new, and that's reputation. Why reputation? Why is this the currency of the future? Because everything we do is based on reputation. You know, you wouldn't come here if you wouldn't know that I have the reputation to uh, tell something interesting. So we cooperate with each other because we know there is a helpful person, and this is how we get help back. And this is why reputation is such a strong tool to change the norms of society. What can you do? Whatever you do, you need to make it public, to talk about it, to make it visible to others. So you can, for example, change with yourself, start with yourself, lower your carbon footprint and make it visible to others. Use your bicycle, buy other products, vote with your wallet. Uh, use your wallet in order to tell the people who harm the environment, we don't want this, we want other products. Divest money. Take the money away from corporations that are harming our environment and put it into the green uh, economy of the future. You can become politically active, you can become a whistleblower, for example. You can put incentives and rewards for corporations and for individuals uh, in order to who behave well. But you can also shame and blame uh, and punish those who, who, don't, who don't contribute. But make it public. And if we talk about you know, language and, and, and we, we speak about gossiping, uh, we need to speak about cultural evolution. What is cultural evolution? In classical evolution, we have, you know, information is passed on from genes to genes in the copying process and natural selection. Humans are the only ones who can, you know, we are surrounded by language and by ideas, and they're all around us. Ideas. We're talking now about ideas. And they are in a battle, same way the genes are, you know, they're waiting to be chosen and to be copied and be copied and be copied and be copied. And, of course, we can copy the wrong stuff. We can copy things that, you know, harm the environment. We need to think who is benefiting from us copying these things, who is behind those ideas, who is setting these ideas up. And, in the end, we need to choose the way. We need to choose the way if we go to one side or to the other, if we stay passively here in our chairs and, you know, we move and move more towards the edge and fall or <laughs> stage diving, and if you, <laughs> or if we go to the other side and we really choose constructive ideas and we copy these ones and we enhance these ones and we change, to so we fight the sources of the climate dilemma and same time we, you know, save uh, the future of Kamea and save ourselves, make the world a better place in the end. Thank you. <laughs>